Good evening, everyone. It's 605, so we're going to get started with the program. Thank you so much for joining the Hofstra University Master of Health Administration Alumni Association program, part of Hofstra's National Public Health Week event series for 2021. I do hope you've had the opportunity to participate in the special programs delivered this week thus far. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Carl Marie Memnon, and I'm the president of the Hofstra University MHA Alumni Association. It is my honor to have been part of the team organizing this event for National Public Health Week. I would be remiss for not thanking my fellow board members, Secretary Justin Brown, historian Marianne Grady, Vice President Dana Moore, Treasurer Charlie Occupenti, immediate past president, Darren DeRosh. This program would also not be made possible without the support of Carmela Rossi, Director of Alumni Affairs and Major Gifts, Dr. Tony Porcelli, Assistant Dean, Dr. Holly Sirup, the Dean of the School of Health Profession and Human Services, Dr. Edward Cofield, Director of the MHA program, and Fred Skanga, Faculty Advisor for the MHA Alumni Association board as well as the Alumni Affairs Office for helping us uh, prepare for this event this evening. The topic burnout and resilience at every level for healthcare leaders is a very timely topic given the current environment as it relates to overall public health, healthcare inequities, the pandemic, and return to somewhat normalcy amidst all this disruption. We will hear from three excellent panelists. Programs such as these are priorities for the MHA Alumni Association. We want to ensure our alumni community continues to have the knowledge and skills needed in the healthcare space. I will now turn it over to Edward Cofield, MHA Program Director and Associate Professor of Health Profession. Dr. Cofield. Hi, Carl Marie, and thank you so much. And welcome everyone to, uh, to, to Hofstra University, at least virtually. Uh, thank you all for, for tuning in this evening. I um, would like to, to start by thanking Carl Marie uh, and all the executive board, as well as Carmela and everyone at the Alumni House for putting this event together. Uh, these events are not <laughs> easy to put together, uh, and I appreciate the time and all the efforts that you all have put together to make this work, because this is a great contribution to National Public Health Week, to the MHA program, as well as to Hofstra University, so thank you. I'd also like to thank um, our three panelists who will be introduced uh, in a little bit, Nadine and Steve and Joy. Uh, thank the three of you for coming out this evening or for tuning in this evening as well. I've got, I, this is virtual versus in-person thing. I, I go back and forth, but thank you all for, for joining us this evening and for, for sharing your insights with us on, on these very top, uh, important topics as Carl Marie talked about when it comes to burnout and resiliency. I, I'm going to keep my, my remarks short. And so a lot of you probably can predict what I'm going to say next, because at a lot of these alumni based events, it's the same story with me again and again and again. A lot of it's about Cami, but some of you may have already heard the stories changed a little bit. Uh, the MHA program, a couple of this semester actually found out from Cami that the program is now a Cami accredited program. And so the program's been working on it for a long time. Thank you, yeah. So it's, um, it's been a lot, uh, but I do wanna take this opportunity to let you know that in case you didn't know, but also to, to thank all of you, uh, to thank the alumni, to thank our community members, to thank all the supporters in the audience. Because the MHA program that you may, you may know about, you, know, you may think of Hofstra, but what we told the CAMI board and what CAMI looked at was not necessarily what just went on in the classroom, but also the experiences that we offered the students, uh, that, that, that value added that when you come to the Hofstra MHA program, it's not just about what you learn in the classroom, but those experiences, that, those applications that you get so that when students graduate from this program, they're practice ready leaders. They're, they're ready to go out there and to contribute to their organizations and to better the health of their communities. That's what we strive for. And we couldn't do that without all of you. Whether um, you're hosting a capstone project at your organization, you're hosting a Hofstra intern, or you're doing professional events like this, right, where students get to come together and they get to learn from professionals in the field about practical healthcare applications. And again, this is a perfect example. A lot of you, have, or at least myself, I've been in awe of healthcare leaders across the globe, what they've done this last year. Uh, we talk about resiliency, right? Think about what they've done, the change they've had to actually face, the transformations they've had to put forth 
and they've done it. They've continued to actually deliver quality, fantastic health care, despite everything that's gone on. And so I look at that, and that aligns great with our mission in terms of why do we have these events? Because our students get to learn from three healthcare leaders right now what resiliency means to them. How can we avoid, avoid burnout as well? This is what the MHA program is about. And this programming would not be possible if it wasn't for all of, all of our community members. So thank you. So thank you so much for all the support that you give the program. My last thank you of support is going to be our, our next speaker, uh, Dean Holly Syrup. Dr. Syrup is the, the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services, as Colmery talked about. She's been a strong advocate for the MHA program. She's a very strong advocate for the Alumni Association as well. Uh, Dr. Syrup and, and her team have put together National Public Health Week uh, at Hofstra University. So, so thank you for everything, Dr. Syrup. And I will uh, turn, turn the mic or the, the, the theoretical mic over to you. Thank you, Edward, and thank you, everyone. Um, before I begin, I just would also like to acknowledge and thank Edward and our amazing MHA faculty for all they do and to formally congratulate them for achieving, for achieving CAMI accreditation. They work diligently. I know you all helped as well, and we are all so proud of you. It's really been a wonderful, wonderful uh, achievement for the MHA program. So anyway, good evening to all of you, and thank you again for joining us at tonight's panel, Burnout and Resilience for Healthcare Leaders. Uh, this has always been an important topic, but certainly brought to the forefront during the COVID-19 pandemic. I remember a quote by Eric Gritson on resilience who said, we all have battles to fight. And it's often in those battles that we are most alive. It's on the front lines of our lives that we earn wisdom, create joy, forge friendships, discover happiness, find love and do purposeful work. So many of you have lived this past year on the front line. And I know you have gained wisdom, some joy, perhaps from seeing the light at the end. And there is no question you've done purposeful and meaningful work. But how do you maintain resilience and avoid burnout in yourselves and those with whom you work and lead? When I think about positions of leadership and qualities of a good leader, I think of individuals who are passionate about their profession and the individuals who work with them. It's important for leaders to recognize when their employees and themselves are being pushed to a point that begins to have a negative impact on their productivity, their interactions with others, and most importantly, on their mental and physical well being. Offering a supportive environment for all employees is essential, regardless of the level at which they're working within the organization. And the success of any organization is directly linked to the employee's satisfaction and the support that they receive from their leaders. Tonight, we applaud the leadership demonstrated by the Master of Health Administration Alumni Association for organizing this event. Talking about burnout and resilience is much needed in the workforce and especially among those in healthcare who have been responding to this pandemic for over a year. So I'd like to thank our Masters of Health Administration Alumni Association for putting this uh, together tonight's event as part of our 2021 National Public Health Week celebration, as well as our panelists who have been so generous to share their experience, their insight, and their expertise. I'd also like to thank Carl Marie, the president of the MHAAA and a member of the HPHS Dean's Advisory Board for her leadership throughout the year and specifically for supporting this event. Once again, thank you for coming and thank you for being here this evening. And I'm so looking forward to a very informative and important discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Syrup. Um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne Grady, who will introduce our panelists. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for our distinguished panel. Um, we have three uh, panelists with us this evening. The first one is Joy D. Calloway, the Interim Chief Executive Officer of Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Joy Calloway is a charismatic transformational leader with 28 years professional healthcare and nonprofit leadership experience. She's currently serving as the interim chief executive officer for Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Joy is a three time graduate of the University of Michigan, BA, MBA, MHSA, where she remains very active with her alma mater, mentoring and preceptoring young professionals. Prior to her current role, Joy served as Interim Executive Director of the National Association of Health Services Executives from 2013 to 2018. 
Ms. Callaway served as president and chief executive officer of New Center Community Mental Health Services in Detroit, Michigan, where she uh, revived and repositioned an agency striving to remain relevant and impactful. A well-respected and well-connected professional and sought after consultant and speaker, Joy is finding great success with the Joy D. Callaway brand as both an international public speaker on topics as wide ranging as mental health, nonprofit board development, community health, leadership and emotional intelligence, and a nonprofit consultant and group facilitator for strategic discussions, team building, workflow, and process consulting, topical training, and strategic and operational planning. Joy is active with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Southfield Alumni Chapter, the Lynx Renaissance Chapter, Impact Detroit 100, a women's philanthropic, philanthropic group, and is a member of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan Board of Directors. Thank you, Joy, for being with us this evening. Thanks for having me. Next, we have Dr. Nadine A. Chang, who is a clinical psychologist and psychology training director at Gracie Square Hospital, a freestanding inpatient psychiatric hospital within the New York Presbyterian Regional Hospital Network. Dr. Chang also holds faculty appointments as assistant attending psychologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital and clinical assistant professor of psychology in psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Chang earned her undergraduate degree in psychology at NYU and PhD in clinical and school psychology at Hofstra University. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx and postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine with Dr. Aaron Beck, where she served as project director and assessment supervisor for clinical studies of schizophrenia and suicide and received the NIH National Research Service Award for this work. Dr. Chang's interests continue to focus on implementing and disseminating CBT for psychosis, suicide prevention, and Asian American mental health. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for being with us this evening. Thank you. Next up, we have Steve Forty, who serves as the Chief Wellness and Resiliency Officer at the Hospital for Special Surgery. He is an accomplished leader with a focus on the well being of medical staff, managers, and frontline staff concentrating on overall stress, physical and emotional management. In addition to his position at HSS, Steve is the CEO and founder of Fit Flight LLC, a global fitness competition application. Steve has served as a consultant for Johnson & Johnson's orthopedic trauma division, where he utilized eight years of critical care and trauma nursing experience in this position. In the military, he earned a rank of Master Sergeant after serving 23 plus years in Army Special Forces, where his specialties included Special, Special Forces Weapons Sergeant and Special Forces Intel Sergeant. He is a level one sniper and attended Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab at DIA, as well as the Special Operations Planners course in Norfolk, Virginia. Steve earned a BS in nursing from Quinnipiac University, completed a critical care residency at Yale New Haven Hospital Systems, and holds a BS in political science from Southern Connecticut State University. Thank you, Mr. Forty, for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Marianne, for the introductions. Um, we will um, begin the panel, and we will start with Joy Calloway. Joy. Thank you so much, Carl Marie, and thank you, Marianne, for the uh, introduction. I am completely honored to be on a panel with these two powerhouses. Uh, I am just completely thrilled to be here. The timing is amazing um, because we are in multiple pandemics all at the same time. And so it's always timely to talk about burnout or stress in the corporate world. It's always timely to talk about resilience, but it is, it is especially an opportune time right now because we are dealing with more than anyone has in almost a generation right in this moment. So I'm really pleased to be here to have the conversation. 
Um, in our opening comments, we're just supposed to kind of frame where we want to go a little bit and offer a little personal. So I know that we're going to go in more detail about how we define burnout, how we define resiliency, but there's certain things that I just want to frame for a uh, level set for my comments as we go through the night. Um, and burnout um, for me uh, really is three things all happening at once. One is about boundaries, one is about expectations, um, and one is about what I call commitment to personal responsibility. And I'll go into detail about those more later, but if we have those three things working in conjunction with one another, um, then we should be able to have a really good idea of not only what burnout is, but how to separate ourselves from that experience of burnout. The example I often give is people will say, ah, this job is driving me nuts. And I'll say to them, it's because you're allowing it to drive you nuts, right? So when we start talking about personal responsibility and setting boundaries, not only for yourself, but for others who place expectation on you, when we start talking about what you expect of yourself and how to manage the expectations of others, then we're gonna get right at the heart of how we separate ourselves from burnout. I'm really excited about that opportunity. Resilience is one of my favorite um, speaking topics, quite frankly, just the idea of understanding how to bounce back. In Detroit, we call it how to get back on our square that place where we feel powerful, where we feel like we can conquer the world, where we are confident, where we are productive, where we are offering the best of ourselves to other people, that is our square. And life happens as we all know, and we end up getting knocked off that square. Resilience is about getting back on it and even more so how quickly we can get back on it. So I'm excited to talk about how we build resilience by building our toolkit, how we build resilience by surrounding ourselves with people who uplift and edify us and how we can pour into ourselves. You, you know that life is going to happen. The, what old people will say, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Any Southern people, you know that statement, right? I tell people the creek is going to rise because it's called life. And so when that creek rises, we have to be prepared and we have to be able to, as I say, get back on our square quickly. It's the chronic, chronic burnout and lack of resiliency strategies where we get in trouble because we're all gonna be burned out at some point. Just briefly on kind of the personal piece, what brings me here, and again, I thank Carl Marie. She knows I'm very passionate about a project that I call One Crisis from Crazy. And what that means, I consider myself a lay mental and emotional wellness advocate. And I come from a place of personal experience. And I tell the folks that I speak with and coach and present to, once you have seen you, the line between your own personal sanity and insanity, your life will never be the same. Once you've had a personal experience with mental and emotional distress, your life will never be the same. And so my passion project, One Crisis from Crazy, is really about talking to people like us who uh, are on the right track and people look at us and think we've got it all together. I tell my women audiences, we've got the right house, heels, husband, handbag. And yet behind those four H's that everybody covets, we're one crisis away from crazy for many different reasons. So a conversation like this is important to me because it allows me to offer of myself and to be transparent and say, I have seen the line between my own personal sanity and insanity after a life trauma that I couldn't get through. And so this opportunity is critically important. The last thing I'll say and then turn it over to my peers, um, as we, you, you all wanted us to talk about kind of pre COVID life and now in COVID life, what we're hopefully seeing post COVID life, the level set for me is in October, I lost my fountain of life it, of October of 2019. In April of 2020, her husband, her groom went with her. And so in the middle of that was the pandemic. So all of those things they talk about not being able to engage your loved one when they're ill, dealing with grief and a pandemic and grief again and a move and life happening and work happening. And in the midst of that, I'm still called on to pour into others like all of you are. So there's a way to work through that and I'm eager to share my experiences with that. Thank you again for having me tonight. I'm excited to be partnered with these two amazing people. Thank you, Joy. And so um, Nadine. 
Hi, everybody. Likewise, I'm really, really happy to be here. And I'm so happy to be able to have this opportunity to talk um, with these amazing panelists and, you know, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I think, you know, the, the timing of this talk is really great because, um, you know, we, we all have just gone through a year of a pandemic and then on top, you know, interspersed in that pandemic were various other major issues um, that came up. And so I do feel like this past year has tested all of us in ways that we never would have imagined. Um, and so, you know, and as a psychologist and specifically a cognitive behavioral psychologist, we focus on how we think about things, right? And so um, something that sort of like underscored a, the last year for me is, you know, not so much focusing on what I can't do. Oh, I can't go outside. I can't see my family. I can't do this, but what you can do, right? And appreciating, you know, how we've become really creative and how to connect. And I don't know about Zoom. I didn't know how to Zoom before COVID, as an example. Um, and so, really, just you know, um, practicing turning your thoughts around to help boost you and motivate you, and you know, boost and motivate those around you. Um, and so, I think a lot of what I'll be talking about is, comes from you know the experiences over the last year. I do work with psychiatric patients directly. I also train psychology uh, doctoral students and working with psychiatric patients and inpatients specifically. So these are people who are experiencing, experiencing a psychiatric crisis. Um, and, you know, I work in a hospital, so I'm, you know, working with my colleagues and, and working with, you know, hospital administration to help develop, you know, policies and new procedures, you know, again, changing every couple of weeks. And so I, um, I feel fortunate to have all of experience and speak to and seeing um, so much resilience has been very inspiring. Um, that being said, what I teach my students and my patients all the time is about burnout and the importance of recognizing, you know, when you are starting to feel burnt out. So just sort of the, the um, self-reflection that's required and that's not natural for everybody. And, you know, maybe I'm too busy to self-reflect, but, you know, those kinds of things that just sort of highlighting the importance so I do um, expect to talk a lot about this last year and how challenging it's been. And so for many of you who, you know, work in healthcare settings, um, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't work from home, you know, <laughs> you know, I went into work every day. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, really fortunate. And, and I guess one other thing that I'll add was, you know, I, I've been doing part, I mean, I guess part of my, my interest in, um, community mental health is really sharing information. So this type of talk is really, I, I find very valuable, you know, to myself as well, because I learned so much from, from people who, who attend these talks. Um, and last year, I, I sort of got tapped to do a lot of community lectures about coping with stress and anxiety and depression during COVID, and then related to the reopening of the city. Um, and so this is something that, I, again, I'm just happy to share this information and in my experience, and, and I'm happy to share what, what I sort of went through. I did have COVID, which, you know, I, I got at the hospital and I was separated from my family for six months um, and then reunited. So, you know, I think, I think it's affected all of us, but I also um, really like to emphasize like the personal piece of it because it has impacted everybody and tested our resilience. So, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Chang. Um, and Steve? Good evening. And uh, again, um, I want to express my gratitude for you, you allowing me, Carl Marie, and inviting me to speak to this group of individuals and be alongside these accomplished panelists. Um, my angle is a little bit different. So I, I had I, my career has been interesting. You know, I did a full 10 years in the military as a Green Beret and Army Special Forces and um, got to deploy and see a good chunk of the world and most of Middle East and Europe. And then 9-11 um, happened and I deployed a few times overseas. Uh, 
it was in a break in service in the military that I actually went to nursing school. And then I did a critical care residency at Yale. And then I got to see life another, from another angle, working in the emergency rooms at a town called Bridgeport Hospital, uh, or in a town called Bridgeport at Bridgeport Hospital. It's a pretty you know, rough and tumble inner city hospital. And um, we had very little money and we had plenty of sick patients from that, that spanned the you know, mental health continuum to the metabolic uh, you know, disease processes. Um, and then apparently at one point in time, I told a friend of mine that if I would ever, uh, if he ever went over to Afghanistan again, that I would go with him. It was probably over a couple beers, but I did honor that commitment. Um, so I ended up re-enlisting in 2008 and deploying over to Afghanistan and finishing out a career in the military. Last thing I did was actually at the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency working at John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, where we worked on large scale projects, understanding like key dynamics of conflict. Well, why do I tell you this? Well, I've been around special forces my entire adult life. It has shaped me um, one way or another, good and bad. I always joke that the best things about me are because of them, uh, because of the people that I, I, I knew and the things that are bad about me is in spite of their best efforts, right? Um, but what I did see is two decades of men going to war. And I want to say this, and if you're going to listen to one thing I say on this, if you haven't served in the military, um, welcome to your first deployment. The similarities of this experience that I have, and it's, you're, it's coming from someone that's deployed to war. Um, I had a kinetic role. I did get in gunfights, and I did put myself at significant risk. The similarities to the environment that we're experiencing right now are extraordinary. I came to HSS uh, on April third uh, a year ago, and I remember driving across the bridges, seeing the signs that were essentially saying, Steve, turn around, you know, wear a mask and Steve, turn around, a and telling everybody to turn around. And it wasn't until that moment that I actually felt that again. And the previous time I felt that was 2009 and 2011 uh, and deploying to a combat zone. Um, it's real. Now, the differences are interesting. Um, what enables you to go at a very high operational tempo in a place like Afghanistan is you have a plus or minus end date. You have an idea. But if someone on this call could let me know when this is over, when things are going to get good again, when is that moment where you step off the plane, I'd be grateful. But I don't think we know what it is. So the angle that I approach um, resilience is been forged a little bit differently. I'm not saying it's better or more effective or less effective, but what I have seen of this, and I'm being very serious, and this is very personal to me, but I wanna share, you're taking the time, so I wanna make it worth it for you on an emotional level. I have buried four people in the past 25 or 26 months to suicide or destructive decision-making. I would imagine that number is on the plus side of 10 to the same over the course of the past 10 years, if not more. I've lost and buried far more guys to combat and I say guys because Green Berets, as of right now, or as up until about six months ago, is an all-male unit. Um, I, I, I've buried more than my fair share, but more, most of it has been as a result of this, this allostatic load that people are experiencing, this incredible stress over time, okay? And that's where we're in right now. So while I know we'll be okay, and I know that we have to be proactive about it, we are beginning the end of this journey. And in the same way that you get in this, what they call the post-deployment deployment phase, when you get off the plane, that's when you lose your adrenaline. That's when you lose your common purpose. That's when you lose your distraction. And I feel that that's the, the area that we're venturing into right now. So when I talk about resilience and when I talk about wellness, it's from that lens. And I'm not saying it to scare or you know, ruin anyone's night tonight because awareness is a good thing. But as we do enter this, I really believe the most challenging part are just ahead. The amazing thing is we've had two decades of war and of experience and we are an incredibly resilient nation. We are a resilient industry that works for and against us. And we'll talk more about that later. But when we talk about these things, we need to talk, look, look really hard at the decisions that we make. And uh, we're gonna talk more about that uh, as we get here. But I thank you all for being a part of this group and I look forward to an outstanding conversation here. Thank you, Steve, for sharing that. Um, and you know, based on the information that we've heard so far, 
Um, very looking forward to um, some of the responses and some of your perspectives um, from the questions that have been um, submitted to us in advance of this um, event for this evening. So with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Justin Brown, who is our um, board secretary, and he will begin asking, you know, some of the questions um, that have been uh, presented to us um, prior to this event. Um, Justin. Sure. Thank you, Carl Marie, and thank you to the panelists for uh, offering us that valuable insight. Uh, with that being said, the first question is, um, attempts are constantly being made to provide what ad administrators believe is necessary to prevent physician burnout. Yet the real things that truly matter to a physician, such as ability to set his or her own, her own schedule, relief from tedious tasks and billing obligations, ability to really get away from his job are never really considered in any serious fashion. When will we start addressing and fixing the real problems rather than window dressing issues? Who wants to start with that one? I'll take it. I'll try. Um, my, my immediate thought when I first saw this question was how about let's talk about the success side of it. So for me, my greatest success in this area has been to partner with physicians uh, to, to manage what I would consider the relative unpleasantries of managing a successful healthcare business, right? So I've been trained as an administrator, obviously have partnered with, I'm in the middle of Brooklyn and they're doing their thing. I'm so sorry, I'll close the window. Um, I, I have partnered with, with physicians in the business of healthcare and it's that partnership that helps us to get there. I don't, I don't believe that any administrator um, wants the feel of just window dressing. Uh, but we can't do it on our own because we are not I, we are not physicians. I'm the one non-clinician here. And so I have to partner with clinicians in order to help them get the experience that they want and also manage the business. Um, if it's okay, this, this question really struck me. Um, having, like I said, gone through COVID and all of the sort of administrative changes that were required over the last year. And I, and I really agree with what Joy is saying here. Um, I, I was in so many meetings, you know, in those early days, like a, about a year ago, um, and looking around the room saying, guys, why am, why am I the only clinician in the room, right? Everyone else was administrative. And I said, we need, you know, I'm a psychologist. We need the psychiatrists, we need nurses, we need, you know, we need the frontline staff here to really give them a voice because we can assume that we know, you know, what's important. And, you know, having an aromatherapy room, which we do have, um, is nice, but I don't have time to go there, <laughs> right? And enjoy it and sort of like the actual, like, reality of the day to day. So I really agree with, you know, and needing the, um, those who are actually experiencing it in order to inform these, you know, higher level decisions. I have the answer. <laughs> um, it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. Uh, the, when we get to this space, right, when we start talking about things like burnout, there are different things that um, load people, that's different things that are damaging to people as they pursue their career in a strenuous environment. And whether that burnout is an experience or that, you know, allostatic load is an experience that clinicians are facing or even administrators in hospitals or hands-on or hands-off, whatever, it's all very real. Um, so in a time like COVID in particular, we have to be careful because the load that gets placed on people affects a different way. And I, I was absolutely flat-footed. I had the same assumption. If it wasn't a clinician, then everybody else was safe. Same as in the military. If it wasn't a gunslinger, um, then everybody else was doing okay because they were in a fairly safe environment. And then I met a, a, a young person um, here at HSS who um, worked in central sterile processing. And the buses didn't help him or work for him. And the things that were being provided weren't really available. And his issues were things like two ailing parents and childcare. So I think we have to recognize that, you know, an environment like this, and even in everyday life, there's incredible stressors and there's incredible load placed on everybody as they try to perform their job. Now, when you say, when are we going to start taking these things seriously? Well, I, I have to push back a little bit and say that I think the industry as a whole is, and they're trying. And I know that the turning point is going to be if it hasn't already happened, 
is when we start using the same empirically driven uh, and in the same analytical procedures to look at clinician burnout as we do you know, with the same veracity that we look at patient outcomes and the same things we look at like with infection control, right? And I'm seeing that happening. The AMA launched a huge study. Uh, I don't even know how many participants they had right now measuring strain on physicians and clinicians and non-clinicians across the country during COVID. And they were able to overlay that based on the, you know, uh, heightened experiences of COVID and the caseload throughout the country. So I think they're doing better. I think we're moving towards better. But I feel the sentiment of the person asking the question, because we've been at war now, to go back to the military piece of it, for coming up on two decades, and we're still experiencing between 19 and 22 suicides a day. And that's a real number, 19 to 22 suicides a day for people that experienced time in the military. And that doesn't even mean that they've experienced combat. The suicides are, are, are military related or deployment related, not necessarily combat related. So I think as soon as we start taking a really, really hard look and what are the things that are placing the load? And we start looking at things like whether it's a lack of patient scheduling or excessive patient scheduling, if it's a lack of support staff, or if it's a lack of time off or administrative load from educational compliance, these are the things that we need to start taking a look at. But I, I'll say that I, I think I'm optimistic because I'm starting to see a trend of people, um, even, even in the short time I've been here, I'm optimistic because I'm seeing those things being looked at. And there's organizations like this that are spreading the word about these issues. So I guess the short answer is when we start taking that quantitative and qualitative approach to it is when we're gonna really see that turn. Great, thank you. The second question is, are newer med students slash graduates feeling the same burnout, burnout as early adopters of EHR slash health IT. I'll go again, if that's okay with everybody. I just have some, some, some space here. Um, interesting when you say that. Uh, so I think, you know, we're all susceptible and I don't have exact stats when you talk about med students. If we start talking about residents, um, I think the answer is yes. And we in particular have paid attention to it and they do feel the effects of it. Um, we'll give you some examples that during COVID, not speaking about HSS in particular, but other hospitals and, and possibly HSS, you know, residents were asked, especially in the world of like orthopedic surgery, right? Or dermatology or all these different residents that people work to match with. And the, in the matter of from January 4th, when the news report started happening till, you know, the end of March and early April, the, many of them in their normal rotations were all of a sudden thrust, like at HSS case, we had people in the emergency rooms at um, major level one trauma centers that were on the front lines, dealing with COVID positive patients, dealing with other trauma. They were going through the um, PPE shortage along with the rest of the nation for a time. So the, the, the strain and stress on them um, was significant. And it goes back to, to the argument, you know, it depends on the individual and how they experience these things. So you don't necessarily have to be on a frontline capacity, or maybe you're really well equipped in the frontline capacity. Maybe standing on the sidelines is the thing that drove you nuts. There was a lot of people that are struggling right now who couldn't get into the fight effectively. Um, so the answer is no one, uh, my answer is that I don't think anyone's safe from it or anyone's free from the incredible stress that has um, been placed upon this, this community. I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think at every level of um, education and every healthcare position comes with its own sort of, you know, stressors. And so, right, I don't think any of us are immune. And uh, we don't have residents um, at, at my hospital. We do have, you know, a lot of trainees of, of different disciplines, including medical students. But I am thinking about um, the medical, uh, the residencies. Uh, residency programs, you know, all over and how they're developing. It, it's like a residence, resident um, mental health, you know, um, some program, right? Be finally acknowledging, you know, just like the tremendous stress that, you know, a residency program puts someone under, you know? Um, so if, if not more, right, 20 years into it, okay, I might not get phased by this and this thing, Bit, right, a first year, you know, student might be, or first year, even early professional might be. 
Um, so I think we're, we're not, none of us are immune to burnout and feeling overloaded and overwhelmed. I think it's just, it's different for, um, you know, depending on where you are in your career and, and, you know, where, where you're working, I mean, what you're doing and, and your own sort of, you know, mental health to begin with. If I can even add to that, Nadine and Justin, if it's okay. Um, maybe the stress for the residents here at HSS wasn't in the care of patients and for many it was but then another piece of that would be many of them relocate to attend in this residency and they haven't seen their family a month in a, in a year and maybe that's the stressor for them um so there was a one very heroic young man here at HSS that they he was really on the front lines but the thing that was was hitting him the hardest was not being able to see his family and his family was was older he was scared and he was concerned and he was isolated so it comes in many shapes and forms. And I think that's what we have to do as an industry. I, I think we need to stop grading and, and weighing stressors like we used to do in combat, right? How much time did they spend in combat? Well, they were only IT. Yeah, well, they were IT in Afghanistan and they were away from their three children. And maybe one of the kids has special needs. These are the real issues that place strain on people over time. I'm wondering if we do, do this like cards, Justin, if we just wave our hand like that instead of tap the table so we can go on to the next question. I have nothing for this one. Okay, so that's no answer. problem. Sure, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, lastly, how, how has COVID impacted the burnout levels and how are the leaders trying to cope up with it? I would love, Justin, to, to open that, that answer. I think that, um, and we've all seen it, we were all talking about it, COVID has, and this pandemic has done something to just our psyche as a, a people. Um, and then you add the pressures of being in a leadership uh, role or striving toward a leadership role. Um, one of the things that I'm finding in the folks that I work with and coach is that this, this, the way we now have to work feels like round the clock, right? So you're at home for many people that work, if, if you're able, if you're, you're not um, hands-on patients and can, can do work remotely, you're at home, but it still feels like this round the clock because there's no separation, right? So when I go into the office, I can get dressed up, I leave, I can walk, I get on the subway, I get to the office, I watch it. So there's this whole process that is part of my day. On days that I'm remote, like today, there's not that same transitional feeling. So there's never this starting to work or ending work. It just, for me, it can just go on and on and on. And so when I talk with people about how do we manage this thing, I talk a lot, as I said at the beginning, about boundaries. How do you set the boundary? When do you decide this is the end of my work day and I'm going to close this laptop and open up the personal laptop and do something fun? Or I'm going to close this and decide I'll have a glass of wine or I'm going to stop. I have to create a stopping point. Now, that doesn't always work, but I know in my mind in order to keep maintain my sanity right, and not get to that burnout place, I have to know what my boundaries are. And I'll close this answer by saying the second half of that setting those boundaries for myself is making sure that I have managed and set expectations for the people that look to me for leadership or partnership or whatever it is they need of me. So that you know I am not going to be able to offer you the best of me if I'm on 24-7. And so here are the periods, even with my daughter, I have a young adult daughter who's about to move, moving into her first job experience. And we're doing the house hunting, or what you call apartment hunting thing, the whole bit. There are times at the end of a crazy day and before I have to perhaps uh, enjoy time like this, where I say, okay, honey, mommy needs downtime right now. I'll talk to you at nine. So we have to learn how to set the boundaries and then share those boundaries and the resulting expectations with the people that look to us for leadership, guidance, impact, love, et cetera. I, I, again, I totally agree. I think we, we're all on the same page here in terms of what's important. And, um, you know, I, I think that in terms of setting boundaries, I 100% agree. Um, and I think it was much easier for like me personally to set boundaries because I was leaving the house and going to work and then coming back. So, but my husband, for example, who was home, you know, it was, there were no boundaries or the children who were, you know, doing homeschooling, no boundaries, right? We finally had to say, you have to put on your uniform anyway <laughs> and not go to school, school in your pajamas, right? Um, but I think also another piece of, um, 
setting, being able to set boundaries is knowing what boundaries to set as well. So, so I mentioned it earlier about self-reflection and being able to recognize in yourself that, okay, this might be too much, you know, I mean, do a little bit more and I still feel okay. So being able to think about, you know, what I'm doing and how it's affecting how I'm thinking and feeling, right? And so if I'm just, you know, complaining about things, okay, that means something needs to change instead of just complaining, which doesn't solve any problems. How can we enact some change, right? And I think that's a way to, you know, and one way to enact change is by setting boundaries, but that's another way to sort of move forward to sort of prevent that burnout that we all see. And I just wanted to make one little point about the hospital setting um, and what, you know, what we all saw there was that burnout would, you know, sort of manifested as like calling out and, you know, um, or, or taking various types of leave and not knowing when people were coming back and, you know, not just sort of not knowing what each day would bring. And, and like Steve was saying, not even so much patient wise, but also just staff. A personal example, which, you know, I had to really work on my, my own self therapy to, to wrap my head around it. In my hospital, there, there are three psychologists um, and two of them left during COVID. Um, so I was one psychologist covering the whole hospital with COVID patients, COVID psychiatric patients, nonetheless. Um, and so, you know, I, I work hard and I really enjoy what I do. I just had to sort of Around, okay, well, I'm not going to be annoyed or upset or, you know, resentful about what just happened because here I am covering the entire hospital by myself. Um, so, so that's something that we saw, but then, you know, okay, how can I turn this around? Okay, well, at least I can, you know, show leadership and still be a mentor to my students who weren't even allowed to come on site anymore and still, you know, maintain. And it, 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 require some creativity, I think. And, and that's another thing I always like to emphasize with, with my students and, and, and my patients is, you know, being creative about ways to build your resilience and create, be creative about how to prevent burnout, you know, um, and sort of thinking outside of the box because in a hospital, it's such like a structured system that, you know, okay, you can say, oh, I'm so boxed in and I can only do things this way or what can I do within you know, these boundaries. So again, it's turning your thoughts around to look at it in a different way. I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I have much to add. Um, I will say this. There, um, there's the measurement piece and I, I think leadership across the board is trying to identify like, what does burnout mean? How do we actually measure it? How do we get a handle on it? You know, what is the gradient? Um, and then I think the next piece of this is, and, and I think Nadine, this will strike a particular chord with you. You know, we are coming to a point where the, the need for healthcare workers will exceed, or mental health workers is going to far, far exceed what we have the capacity for. And that's happening. Um, so institutions are trying to lower the barriers to access to mental health resources. Um, I know I could speak for HSS, where in addition to the programs that we had in place, in addition to people's insurance that they had, um, they actually brought in outside contractors to make that more seamless in terms of accessibility. Uh, it's crazy right now. I, I wear my, I mean, I literally am like walking down the street saying like, you should talk to somebody. I go to a counselor every two weeks. I mean, it's like, I got my guy and he's fantastic and there's nobody that's gonna tell me there's anything wrong with it. It's a badge for me. And I know that my life is better with it. My marriage, my parenting, all of it is better with that in our lives. So I think a lot of institutions have taken a very important first step in trying to be uh, proactive about addressing that um, need that's coming and also lowering the barriers to access. How do we get people to start high-fiving, and I'm gonna go back to this later, high-fiving about going to a therapist or high-fiving about taking a mental minute or a reset or a meditation app. When does that become as cool? Or when does that become as sexy as uh, gotta get home and grab a couple of really nice glasses of red. I got a chateau enough to pop waiting for me. Like that's what we applaud. 
when we know absolutely that sleep's a really good thing when you're feeling down and sleep's a really good thing when you need to be more resilient. And we know alcohol consumption stands in the way of that. And that was my fight in the military community. So I'll probably get back to that a little bit. So I, I think when we start changing our language, um, I think when leadership starts changing the language and starts rewarding that thing of self-care, I think we're going to see some really positive results from it. I just have one Thank you. or a couple of things to add to that. Uh, you just sort of reminded me, Steve. Um, what I was really happy to see, and again, like I try to focus on the positive as well, um, was you know, um, uh, New York, my, my hospital, Gracie Square Hospital is part of New York Presbyterian Hospital. And so New York Presbyterian, um, they implemented uh, a sort of crisis hotline um, specifically for hospital staff. And it was just a call in crisis line, you know, um, for anything that you wanted to talk about. And it was really great. And I ended up, you know, it, it's sort of ironic because I was just complaining about being the only psychologist. Um, but when I did actually um, uh, contract COVID, I had to stay home, right? And like I said earlier, my family, my, my, I have a husband and, and three children, they were not living with me at the time. So I went home to this empty house and I'm like, what am I gonna do? And you know, I fantasized about watching TV. So I watched TV for three days, but then I had seven more days of sitting by myself at home. What am I going to do, right? So I ended up volunteering for this crisis line with New York Presbyterian. Um, and it was really, um, is actually very inspiring and, and really, um, I, I found it very uh, valuable, a very valuable experience. And it was mostly nurses who called in. Um, and again, they weren't really stressed out about COVID it was not about the work piece of it, but you know, there's a labor and delivery nurse who just started a new job two weeks before in the middle of COVID and, you know, and was feeling unsure of herself because she was a new grad, right? And then another um, ICU nurse who was not bothered about being in the ICU, but she missed her two small children and, and her husband, you know, who weren't living with her, which I definitely resonated with. Um, so that was something that I really appreciated. And I think it was so popular, like we would sign up for shifts and, you know, and then oftentimes there was like waiting time, like waiting periods because so many people were calling in. What I was happy to see was that even as to come to an end, um, there weren't so many people in like working in the ICU, um, they actually, they, they, they closed the crisis line because, you know, not enough people were calling in, but they still have that program. So anyone can just call or email, um, you know, the director of the program and say, is there somebody I can talk to? And then they send an email out saying, is anybody available at 5 p.m. tonight? Um, so that's something that I, I feel like really, that's where administration, the staff needed. Um, and so that was something that I was happy to see. And similarly, other you know programs that we had implemented during COVID are continuing, like using iPads, um, where when patients were on isolation, you know, in psychiatric unit, there's no TVs in the rooms. And so here's a patient who's in, you know, on isolation. And what do we give them to do? Crossword puzzles, and you know, it only goes so far. When you're at the time, they had to quarantine for two weeks, and so, you know we purchase some iPads so they could FaceTime with their families, right, who couldn't visit them in the hospital. They could do some activities, watch some YouTube. Um, and so now we've continued that even though right now we don't have any COVID patients, but we have other patients who are on isolation for other reasons or, or bed bound, you know, and can't engage in like the unit activities. So we're still using iPads. So our patients, you know, who are going on where they can't leave their rooms, they can still actually interact with other people. And we're working on, you know, um, doing like virtual like group therapy via Zoom as well. So I'm, I'm glad to see that it's, you know, our administration didn't just say, okay, well, the crisis is, you know, you know, not such a crisis anymore. So let's take away all of these things that we started. I'm happy to see that they, they've responded to the staff and the patients, um, you know, feedback on those programs. So, I mean, for, it's, it, was a, it was a rocky road getting there, but now we're here and, and you know, appreciating what, what worked. Great, thank you. 
Um, and I'll pass it along to our immediate past president, Darren, for the following questions. Thank you so much, Justin. Good evening, everyone. Um, for this next question, uh, please bear with me. It's a little bit longer. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question now. I find myself always doing fathers, including providing opportunities for wellness and burnout prevention initiatives for my staff and not enough for myself. In conjunction with my day-to-day -day responsibilities while trying to balance my personal life, I have found myself burnt out many times and provided little focus to my own personal wellness. Aside from the toll that 2020 took on healthcare workers and leaders alike, competing priorities always arise in the ever evolving healthcare landscape. With the world being different, how do you operationalize your own wellness and longevity? How do you manage the stress and anxiety that prevents one from experiencing the activities that brings health and joy. I feel this is a, necess uh, a necessary skill to hone in order to advance forward in my career. I'd love to see that one up because they use my name in the question. So it, it follows that I should uh, go ahead and take a stab at this one. Um, the, the, the thing that immediately came to my mind is you must center and prioritize choosing you. You must center, that means get it in the middle and prioritize, make it, take it above the other things, choosing yourself. So I'm saying choose you. Now, as my grandmother would have said, well, baby, that's simple, but it ain't easy. I get that. I understand. It sounds very simple to choose you, but when you have family pressures and community pressures and work pressures, it's not an easy thing. But I remind you that you can only give of your overflow, not your essence. And life will deplete your essence unless you fill it back up and build it back up. And so I will tell you that I have been um, in, in this very place many times because again, the creek is gonna rise, remember? And so I had trained myself to know when I am getting to a place where I am no longer going to be able to offer my best self to the people that look to me for love and leadership and impacts, right? And so once I see myself getting to that place, I am reminded, Joy, you're, you need to put yourself in the center and choose you. So that means sometimes you have to make those hard decisions. I had an afternoon probably three weeks ago where all heck was breaking loose from a work perspective, which happens you know, many days in a healthcare environment, uh, especially a community-based one, where uh, I, I had things that had to get done and I could feel myself getting to the end of my rope, just, just, just mentally, emotionally, it get to the end of that rope. I chose me. And I shut down that afternoon. And guess what? Nothing crazy. Now remember, I'm not a clinician. Nobody died. The building didn't burn down. Nothing, everything that was there that afternoon was still there the next morning. Yet I had had, Steve, my glass of wine and some rest, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I had had some time to chill out. I had my blasted jazz music. I had some time in the, uh, with my journal in the bubble bath. I chose me. And what the problem is as upwardly mobile professionals or leaders, and we wanna be in these, these, uh, these roles and it's exciting to be in these roles and we do great work. But if I am not taking care of me and something happens as much as they love us today, I know you've all heard that this, as much as they love us today, before you are in the ground, they will have another name plate outside of your door. And so you must choose yourself. Joy, I wanna know your grandmother. Um, I got called out on that one, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer. And I should point out that my problem wasn't having a glass of wine. It was the subsequent glasses that uh, <laughs> crept into the space a bit. Um, Listen, we, we there's a lot of smart, I'm gonna be somewhat Steve here for a moment. Um, we could have been hedge funders. We could have worked in private equity. Uh, we chose a different path. We chose a path of service. We chose a path that had two meanings. One, there's a financial component of 
higher education and working in working our way up through an executive level. And that's a, a great stable thing, but it's not a selfish industry. It's not an industry that you don't give back more than you get. And we could have been hedge funders. We could have, all right, but we chose other. Um, so I don't think we're any of one of us is shocked when we say I take care of others before I take care of myself. As a matter of fact, if you were to Google Mayo Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic burnout, one of the you'll see a criteria come up of what predisposes you to burnout. And if you start at the end of it, you see all the symptoms. But if you go to the beginning, one of the key points is, and I know some of you are doing it, one of the key points is the closer that you are tied to your occupation, the more at risk you are for burnout. Okay. Where else have we seen that? Suicides in the military. A mistake that you make in uniform isn't a bad day at work. It's a referendum on who you are as a person. You lose patience with a patient, and it's a referendum on who you are, or whether or not you're kind or good at your job or a decent human being. All of these things that many other occupations don't feel. So I don't think we're ever going to stop having this discussion about I take care of others before I take care of myself, but I will introduce a topic here that's very near and dear to me, and it's let's all try to stop being so heroic in the way that we try to fix what ails us, okay? I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll make fun of myself, right? I guarantee one of these years, I'm actually going to run an ultra marathon, but it's not this year. But yet I promise it every year, despite not having run a 10K or a 5K for the previous three. We do this, we go for these grand heroic things. And then over the past year, I started a different practice. Okay, whenever I walk my dog in the morning, first thing in the morning, that's my time for me to take five to 10 minutes to breathe, to feel every footstep, to be mindful of what I do. And then I also take five minutes every morning when I log onto my keyboard first thing every morning. You don't have to restructure your life. You don't need a three week vacation. You don't need a six month sabbatical to move the needle positively in your direction and build your resilience. We will always struggle with doing for others. I yell at my wife for it constantly. She really doesn't even understand the concept of putting herself first. She was a nurse as well. Now she's a mom and she does a great job with it. But we're always gonna fight this fight, but that doesn't mean that we have to save it and change it completely. We can do these small incremental steps that make an incredible difference in your resilience. And I'll give you some concrete examples. Five minutes of meditative breathing lowers your heart rate by 15% increases your heart rate variability and decreases your sleep depth and duration by about 15 to 25%. That's no small thing. And we should all do more of that. So I can leave it right there. And it's okay to have a glass of wine. I don't know if I can be as eloquent um, as either of you, but um, as I think about um, health and wellness, and I think about motivation for work, because yes, we, we chose this, we, we chose healthcare, we chose these careers, right? And so I, you know, you can think about and what sort of, you know, keeps me motivated and going um, is that I, I do truly like what I do. I love what I do, you know, and I think about why I, you know, got into this field and why inpatient psychiatry, why schizophrenia, like why these things and as long as I feel like I'm still moving towards that, and you know, it's we never, I won't say we never reach our goals, but our goals are always changing, right? And so, even though my when I was younger, my goal was to be a psychologist. Okay, I'm a psychologist. All right, now what's next? Okay, I want to do this. Okay, now now what's next, right? And like that to me is motivating while keeping my goals and keeping in mind what I do enjoy doing. Um, that being said, I totally resonate with what both of you are saying in terms of um, taking care of yourself first. And actually I'm, I'm giving a talk um, in two weeks um, on, on resilience specifically. Um, and my first, my step one is to take care of yourself. And, and I, you know, I, I have students and I have patients at work and then I come home to three small kids. And so I'm going, 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 going. And one day, this, this actually just happened uh, maybe like a month ago. Go. I realized I hadn't sat down until 8 p.m. I hadn't sat down. <laughs> I'm like, what is, what is going on? This is nuts. And so, okay, that means I need to sort of restructure what I'm doing because at eight o'clock, then I'm 
exhausted because I've been, you know, on my feet for so long. And so, you know, I, I, I was just thinking about how I tell my kids that I need a break is that, um, you know, mommy needs to take care of herself so that she can take care of you. Right. And that's something that I think we all, you know, can, can keep in mind is like, take care of yourself so that you can do what you want to do and, and what, you know, what drives you. And if you want to be a good, whatever it is, you know, you do have to be in, in the position where you can be right. Because if I'm exhausted, then I'm not going to be so patient when they're refusing to brush their teeth, for example. <laughs> um, so, so I think, really, yeah, really emphasizing, and I'm so guilty of not doing this, um, of, you know, taking time for myself that, you know, what we have, we have a whole calendar, and there's like this block of time for me, and this block of time for me, you know, and then I'll try to sneak in other times if I can. But oftentimes, I, I don't. So, so I'm totally guilty of it, but I also recognize the importance of it. And, and that, you know, reminds me to remind others as well, how important it is to, you know, take care of yourself and your own, you know, your own mental health and not even just mental health, but find your own peace in what you're doing. I, I would offer, and it might dip into another question, but I would offer too that we have to, uh, I would encourage all of us to learn how to prioritize our own mental and emotional health wellness in community. I need accountability because like all of us that we can go, we could go so hard caring for others, doing for others, doing the job thing, doing the community thing, all the things that we do, we do, we do. It helps me to have someone that said that to, to, to remind me that it's time for some joy time every once in a while, somebody that will keep me honest to the commitments that I've made to myself. And so I encourage you all to consider that as well. If I can add one thing, you know, we've all heard the analogy about putting your oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on someone else. Am I the only one on this call that thinks that only really applies to actually being in a decompressed aircraft? Like, I can't imagine any other time where that would be any one of our courses of action. So I think that's good in practice, but I know in my head, I'm like, or I'll just do them both at the same time really, really fast, right? Like, I mean, it's just where we go to. Um, so there is definitely an element of self-care. I just think we need to be gentle with ourselves because for me, it becomes one more thing I fail at, right? It becomes one more weight on this allostatic load of, and I'm not taking care of myself and I'm getting out of shape and I'm not eating like I should be. So I just think we really need to pull back a little bit on our expectations in this space. And I agree with Joy and Nadia completely, like nothing that they say was out of line with what I agree with completely. But I do think we need to be really gentle in our approach and our expectations of ourselves. Otherwise that becomes part of the, part of the problem. Thank you so much. Um, actually, some of your responses are gonna lead us into our next question. I'm gonna jump a question and then go back. Um, the next question I'm gonna ask from our audience is, what are some ways you participate in health and wellness in your own life? You know, I'll start with this one because it's an opportunity to build a community accountability for those of you all who I already have a relationship with. Um, I uh, consider my um, quest toward wellness kind of the weight loss battle, this whole thing. I consider that my chronic health issue, right? So there's sometimes when I'm super fine, that means I'm in remission. And there's sometimes when I have a flare up, right? And after a year and a half of, um, a, a, again, grief of losing my parents and the pandemic, and it just, you know, I, I recognized that I was in a bit of a, a flare up. And yet, like you all, I have so much going and so many people pulling on me and, you know, come out to you know, picked up and moved for the new gig. And there are all of these things happening. And like I said, I believe in accountability partnership. So for me, as I as I recognize and work through the flare up, I chose to um, bring a health coach into my community. Right. To, to help me out. Now, let me tell you something. I'm old school. I don't believe in wasting time or money. And so if I write you a check to tell me, you know, uh, did, did, to ask, did you work out? Did you drink your water? Did you do your meditation? Did you do, eat right? Did you do, 
That means I'm going to be on program because I don't want to look up three months from now having written these checks, which I just told on myself when I said wrote a check, the millennials don't even know what a check is. When I pay this money um, and not having um, made the, the, kept the commitment to myself. So wh what do I do at this point? It's, a, it's about accountability and expertise. Obviously you're not just grabbing any old body. Uh, but that is where I am at this stage. And, um, and, and there's the last thing I'll say is that piece about being gentle um, with yourself. The term I use is grace. If you think about the grace that you offer everybody else in your life, we're healthcare people. So I know you all are full of grace. Think of the grace you offer, you know, your, your colleagues or the patients or your family or your friends. We often, more often than not, do not offer that same level of grace to ourselves. And so that's a that's a, actually a therapeutic pathway for me right now in my therapy is how do I offer myself more of the grace that I offer others. Nadine and I are having a stand. Yeah. Here. You want to go? I don't... Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay, either, either one is fine. Um, I think in terms of like I said, I, I just confess that I'm guilty of of not always. Um, prioritize. I, think I just need that external reminder. And so there's two things that I just came to mind. Um, like I'm saying, like I said before, I really, I really love my work. I really love what I do. But if I find myself being even like a little bit like, oh, I don't feel like going to work today. If I think that, that means, oh, I need a break. I need vacation. Right. And that's what I say to my students. That's what I say to my coworkers. You know, I'm pretty motivated to go to work, but if I, I'm or something or even feeling apathetic, that means, oh, that's red flag right there for me that I, I need to, I need a little break, whether it's a day or a week, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's something. And then another thing is that uh, in terms of accountability, I definitely need external accountability for certain things. And so for exercise, but for, first of all, I, I'm not like a natural exercising person. So I have a, a, a trainer that I've worked with for, for more than 10 years now, who's a good friend of mine now. Um, and when she finally started um, like virtual sessions, I said, okay, I, I paid for these sessions, so I'm not going to cancel last minute because now she's my friend and I don't want to disappoint her and I don't want to lose my money and you know da, da, da. so that sort of external accountability really helps um, and and thankfully I have I have a, a partner who's um, who's also you know, recognizes I don't take time for myself and so he'll say it's time for you to go da, 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 you know go get a pedicure, go get your hair cut. And aren't you late for your hair appointment or aren't you late for Pilates or whatever it is? Because I can be like, ah, oh, maybe I'll be late. Or maybe, you know, maybe I won't go today. And, and then he puts it on me. Cause again, we're, we're, you know, a, adjusting our schedule of, you know, a family of five, you know, to, for me to be gone for an hour or two hours. So that definitely helps <laughs> um, because, right, our, our tendencies might not be to take care of ourselves and to like make sure everybody else is okay, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> this is a hard one for me because I came from an environment where, an you know, an incredibly high level of physical fitness was a job prereq. Right? It was part of the human operating system. Right, you had to be able to run X minute miles and go for as long as you needed to go to to complete a mission. And now I realize that as but I joke about being an adult now, right? Um, we're not in this world where you get paid to work out four and five hours a day and shoot guns and do all the stuff you'd always dreamed about doing. Um, we have to draw a line between fitness and health. You can be very, very healthy without shredding yourself four to five times a week for 30 to 45 minutes. You can be very healthy with the decisions you make and the choices you make. You can be very healthy with good dietary guidance and you can be very healthy with ensuring that you're getting a good night's sleep. And I go back to the sleep thing over and over again, right? Insomnia correlates with, uh, and uh, Dr. Chang can back this up, insomnia correlates as almost as closely as suicide as a previous suicide attempt, like real diagnosed, like it is a real problem. So I think when we go back to this piece that I talked about, about being you know, less than heroic in our endeavors, 
before we would do anything physical or before we would do anything in our professional careers or before we did anything for people that we care about, we would define what our end state looked like. We would define what their end state looked like, right? How do we get them off the medications that we prescribed or how do we get them out of the cast that we put them in or how do we do these things? And the same should be for, for us, right? Right now I'm training to be a mobile parent. That's my thing. I want to be able to play with my kids. I had kids older. I got a bunch of them. And um, I want to be a, a good parent. I want to be able to roll around in the grass and jump on the trampoline and do those things. So this is where the less than heroic thing came for me. Like, how am I going to be able to do that without making myself more vulnerable? Because there's a balance in that. And we go back to that grace piece, that gentle piece. So I think we have to be very careful, especially in a time of COVID, with confusing fitness with healthy. It's hard to be fit. It really is hard to maintain a constant level of readiness, but it's not hard to be healthy. It's not hard, or I shouldn't say it's not hard. It's less hard to be healthy. It's less hard to get appropriate amount of sleep. It's less hard to make good, thoughtful dietary choices. So I wish I had the time I used to to train. I wish my body bounced back like it used to, and it does not by at all. I wish my joints didn't have the miles and the body armor in the years that I had with it, but I will say that I'm pretty happy right now with myself and how I've, you know, created a new expectation for myself of what fitness looks like. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit for my final question, um, which is, how do you navigate highly political and toxic work environments within healthcare? Highly is the word that struck me because if it's highly political and highly toxic, my answer is you get out because any place that is highly toxic, we'll start there, is not good for you. And I know that in order for us and, and to, to climb the, the healthcare corporate ladder in order for us to be in the positions that we want to be in the level of visibility and the perquisites that, that come along with it, you know, there's going to be politics, there's going to be some toxicity. But again, I go back to boundaries. Uh, I don't know, and I think Steve said it earlier, we could all be doing something different and making maybe even more money and, 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 more, and, and, and more prestige or whatever those things may be. But at some point, I ask myself, uh, what price sanity? So I know my limits. I know the type of work environment where I will thrive where I will be able to offer my best on the regular. And I know those type of environments that are not suited for me. Every, grandma again, Steve, everything ain't for everybody, right? And so we may have aspirations to say, I wanted to be a physician. I was talking to a friend last night who's a, a high ranking uh, ob gen type down at Cleveland Clinic. And I'm told, I said, you know what? I used to want to be a, a, a doc. And then I realized that was not who I was suited to be as I was going through that process. So just because you aspire for, toward it doesn't mean that that is who you are created to be. That does not mean that that is the pathway that makes the most sense for you. So, you know, some of it is, is to be expected. So you have to manage the politics. You have to learn the game. Uh, but you have to set your limits and stick to them because there is no there is no job, no experience worth your mental and emotional wellness. I'll fill in the gap here on this one. Um, I, I'm blessed to work where I do. Uh, I truly don't experience that where I'm at, but I have been in toxic environments, right? And I've yet to in the military, you know, I've yet to um, be in a toxic environment that couldn't be directly attributed to the leadership. And like I said, I, I don't have that problem right now, and I'm so grateful for it. And in the military, it's an interesting thing because on, on the civilian side here, I would say vote with your feet. I'm out of here. I got a wife. I got to be, a, you know, I got I, I, I'm in a place. I'm a parent. I'm a whatever. And that there's opportunity and that there's capable people here and you shouldn't have to tolerate that. So if you can't not internalize it, you can't not somaticize it, then you have to make a course correction and find a place that's better suited for you. That being said, I've been in the circumstance um, where you don't have the ability to vote with your feet. 
I will say that after this year, after this summer in particular, and I think as a result of the COVID crisis, I don't know that, and I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch, I think more people across the board have more of a voice than they have had in the past. I think there's more resources available. And whether it's here at uh, HSS, we have a RISE peer support group that you could talk to about these things, whether it's through an HR channel or whether it is through mental health resources that are available. Um, but white knuckling a toxic environment is a horrible strategy. Um, I know that I had never been successful with it. Um, so I think, I think the, the answer is how do you do it? Well, you don't do it directly, you don't tolerate it and you utilize the resources that are, that are available to you. What I'll say is this too, I've been on a bit of a apostolic tirade here at HSS talking about all the mental health resources. And I'm always shocked that when we get to a certain point and I ask questions, who's heard of this? And I've been at this for 12 months, I'm still struck sometimes by how few people have heard of some of the resources. So what I would say is do a deep dive into your own organization and really find out what resources are available to you. You might be surprised. Yeah, really, really great point. Um, so yeah, I also uh, haven't really experienced a highly toxic work environment, but you know, again, I'm very motivated at work and I really enjoy what I do and not everybody at work enjoys what they do. So I end up being the psychologist, like many, many staff members confidant, right? And so I hear about these frustrations. I hear about these, you know, sort of, you know, large and small frustrations and, you know, going back to the idea of self-reflection and sort of looking at, is this what I want? And is what I'm getting out of this job worth, you know, sort of managing and not necessarily white knuckling, but figuring out a way to manage and sort of balance what I'm going through here. So, you know, how, how does that, how, how does that work? Does job satisfaction uh, in, in terms of like, maybe if it's clinical work, right? versus, oh, I have to deal with this, you know, whatever, you know, supervisor. So I, I totally agree that the, the leadership is, is huge there because it's, you know, in the hospital system, it's very top down, right? It's so hierarchical that the leadership is so, so important. Um, and, and at the same time, okay, if I feel like my supervisor is, you know, not meeting my needs, and then I'm unhappy about something, is, is the satisfaction I'm getting from my clinical work enough to sort of balance all of these things, right? So it is sort of a balancing act um, where you sort of decide. And then if I decide, okay, I'm gonna stay in this, this situation, whatever it is, um, going back to that, you know, looking at this, this like hospital system as like a structure and not confines, but more of like, what can I do within these limitations, right? And so how can I make things better for myself or better for others too? Um, that kind of, that, that's, what it, that's what I think about in terms of, you know, sort of managing and, and, and really just prioritizing your needs, um, right? Because nobody wants to work in a highly toxic work environment. That's not, that's not sustainable. Right, um, that's just going to speed up that burnout, and then, and then you know there might be some other negative consequences there. So, also you know I like to think about like those longer term effects, as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering those questions from um, our, our audience in advance. I'm now going to turn it back over to our current president, Carl Marie. Thank you, Darren. Um, keeping in line with some of the, um, the points that you mentioned in the, the previous question, um, one of the questions that um, was also asked you know, in advance is what is, most like, what is the most likely cause of burnout in healthcare careers? Um, so wanted to get your perspectives on that. I, I can start with this one. Um, that, that question as it's phrased is almost impossible to answer because there is no one thing that goes into this, this concept, right? Um, we have to look at it this way. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, you're, you have the privilege here of speaking with the worst soldier ever to put on the uniform. 
I was terrible in a garrison setting back on a regular military base where all the rules and regulations and all the strict everything applied. But I did great when I was downrange. I did great deploying and I deployed a lot, 17 times in a 20 year career. Um, I did very well doing my job. It was when I was not doing my job. And I use this point to illustrate that. Uh, and that's where I got in trouble. Like whenever I was back in base, I was always getting into some kind of trouble, especially as a young man. Couldn't, couldn't not get in trouble. And my point of what I'm trying to illustrate here is, you know, we have a, a vessel in an environment. If we look at the neuroplasticity of these things, right? We're a vessel in an environment and everybody has a different um, resistance to certain stimuli, different response to different stimuli. And some of them are a negative response and some of them are a recharging response. When people talk about burnout, the opposite of burnout is bored. It's not well rested. There's a place in between those two things where you reach optimal performance. So you need to stay within that space, okay? And on the right side of this slope, if we pictured it as a bell curve, on the right side and left side of this slope are all of these things that lead us to an extraordinary amount of boredom, which is not good for us. That would be the isolation that Dr. Chang felt when she was first um, on her three-day Netflix binge and then had to actually become really productive because that's who she is. And that helped put her up into this side of the curve where she was productive and engaged and uh, performing a little bit more optimally. And then you get to the other side of that where the load is so great that it actually becomes detrimental. You can't see, you can't work, you can't function and you're ineffective, okay? So to say what one thing goes into it, it's all of those things. It's who you are as a person combined with the million different things that affect you in the way that they do. And for some of those, it's work-related stress. For some of it's relationship. For some of it's isolation. Okay, COVID has been a dream for the true introvert. Right, introverts hate going off to work every day. Public speaking is a nightmare. But if they can actually have a blacked-out screen in front of them, be productive and be alone, they're they're doing well right now. So while that environment might be detrimental to an extrovert like myself, introverts have been thriving in this work-from-home space. They really have, and I'm not. This is not anecdotal, this is real. Well, it's anecdotal, but it's real information and real feedback that I've received. Um, so it's, it's a variety of different insults. The main thing is, you know, the end state of burnout is all the same and it doesn't matter what the insult is. Some of it could be drug and alcohol abuse or it could be stimulants. Some of it could be insomnia. Some of it could be relationship strain. There could be a domestic violence piece of this that is an incredibly stressful part that can contribute to that. If we look at burnout among physicians and physicians alone, female physicians are far more susceptible to burnout. It is not because they're less resilient. Let me repeat, it's not because they're less resilient. It's because the convert current environment in which we live and the fact that they're moms and then sometimes single parents and doing homework and working their primary job and handling the COVID testing for their kids and getting back to school and the Zoom classes and all of these things. So the insult, this environment lends itself to certain people and not to others. So I think that's what I want the takeaway to be with this, with this point is that there is no one thing that, that uh, applies that insult for burnout but it's a collection of negative things that build up and it's usually over time. I wanted to amplify one was an awesome response. I wanted to amplify the one thing that Steve said that I was at, that was at the base of my response to this. And he talked about who you are as an individual, how you approach life, how you approach challenges, how you approach conflict, how you approach promotion, how you approach all of these things. It really starts with who you are as an individual, how resilient you are, how comfortable you are with uncomfortable emotions being present for you and how, how um, masterful you are or are not in processing those emotions, be they comfortable or uncomfortable. So I really want that piece to sit there. I don't want any of us walking away thinking, well, it's the boss. It can be part of that might be the boss or it's the team or it's the patients or it's the workload or it's the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the profit and loss statement. It could be all of those things are contributing to it, but to what are they contributing? And I, my response to that would be they're, they're contributing to the experience that you create for yourself based out of who you are and how you show up and how you bounce back when things are challenging. 
Great. That's th those are both perfect segues into what I was going to say, because if we look at um, so I, I used to be a, a researcher and, and um, some other things I, I did do research in suicide. Um, and two of the biggest predictors of suicide was was not any like one experience um, or even depression. It was the idea of of being hopeless and helpless. Like there is no opportunity for change. There's nothing I can do about it, right? So whether it's you know COVID or, or any other stressors that that we can even imagine, it's not just having that stressor. It's there's nothing I can do about it, right? There's no future for me. I can't do anything, right? So it's not the boss, right? It's not the terrible boss that's the problem. It's you feeling helpless to enact any change in the situation. So I think that's something that also is, you know, a predictor of burnout is that that helpless feeling um, of like, okay, I only I can only do what I'm told to do, and there's there's no option. Right. And that's why I talk a lot about creativity and figuring out what you can do as opposed to what you can't do. Right. Because if I just think about what I can't do, then I'm, I'm helpless and I might start feeling hopeless. If I can add to that, I think it's important. I know I've been talking a lot here, but this is so near and dear to me. Um, they did a huge meta analysis of soldiers that served in combat zone from 2003 up until 2017, I believe the um, two top complaints and things that led to substance abuse post deployment. Neither of them were combat. Okay, it was lack of control and uncertainty about timeline. And the amount of square footage people were sharing in space. And here we had a time of COVID where everyone is sharing less square footage and no one has a certain timeline. So when I say welcome to your first COVID deployment, I say it affectionately, but I say it with some experience. That's what we're dealing with. It's not the combat and the combat has never been the thing that has led to the post-traumatic stress and isolation or the alcohol or substance abuse. It's all of it, but it's actually some of the other things that weigh more heavily than that. So I can leave that there, but thank you for giving me the, the time. To to share that. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we also received was, um, I know you've all talked a little bit, you know, uh, not a little bit, but a lot about yourselves too, but like what are challenges you're facing now? None, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Work-life balance, right? Um, Joy brought it up so beautifully, I think, in the first response to the question, you know, the close your laptop, I close it, I open it again, and then I check my phone. I had a rule for myself on the weekend that I had this tiny table by a front room and that my cell phone would stay plugged in and that I couldn't even use it if it wasn't plugged in. So I, if it was really important to me, I would have to stand there and, and text away from my family as a general reminder. Um, so that's, I mean, that's my thing. Like, when are we done with work, right? When is the expectation? And then we also feel like I keep scoring my head, but it's only against me. If I have to drop my kids off at school one time at 8.30 or nine o'clock in the morning and I end up getting here into the city at 10 o'clock, I have this thing all day where it's, I owe hours back. But it never goes the other way when I get a phone call at 7.30 or eight o'clock on a Friday night. And I'm like, I'm subtracting hours on Monday. We never take back our own time. So that would be my biggest challenge. And I'm open to hear anybody's tips on how I can reclaim that because uh, I'm not crushing that at all. That concept of we never reclaim our own time, that might be a, a chapter in my book. So I'll, I'll give you a, a kudo for that. That's a good one. I think that it's been, it's been cool really to think about this topic in a personal way. I know we've shared a lot about professionally and how we do it. I think um, it's important to be reminded that as uh, we traverse these professional pathways, the life stuff still happens. So learning to transition um, from parenting um, a, a young child, you know, a teenager, et cetera, moving into that, how do you parent a young adult for me is, is one of the things that I am um, being um, uh, stretched by. I don't wanna say challenged by, being stretched by. I'm growing and I'm learning in that area. I already talked to you all about my 
you know, I've kind of fallen off the healthcare wagon. So coming back uh, into that world, that's always a challenge, right? Um, because life still happens and you, you just have to, you have to reprioritize some things. Um, and I think always, like all of us, we want to be our best professionally and at the same time, be our best personally and be our best to ourselves and to the people around us. So that, um, that whole balance is something that is very, again, I won't say I'm struggling with it, but it's very present for me right now. And then, and, and then of course, and I, I say it to, to put it in the atmosphere because it helps my healing also traversing this grief pathway um, and, and making sure that I surround myself with things that comfort me um, and still advance uh, my healthcare goals as well. Well, I already confessed that I don't take time for myself, but um, so we know that's a, a challenge that I'm still trying to work on. Um, one other thing that I'm trying to, to work on um, is delegating, delegating tasks, delegating responsibilities, um, you know, both at home where, you know, my, my husband might think that I'm bossy and I'm, I'm you know, I'm the decisions and you're not doing it right kind of thing. Um, down to my kids saying, mom, I can do it myself, right? Which I forget because they're not babies anymore. I mean, they're not, they're not teenagers either yet, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kids. Um, but also at work, you know, where I'm not, I think I got very used to being the only psychologist and then delegating certain responsibilities once one, one of the two came back, the other one decided not to come back. Um, and delegating, like what to delegate, I think is, is what I'm trying to still navigate because, and part of it is me thinking, okay, well, it's just easier for me to do it instead of explain how to do it. Or I don't know if it'll get done right if I don't do it, you know, those kinds of things. And so I think that does take away from me, you know, having my, my, like, you know, prioritizing myself as well. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I'm notorious for you know, telling my students, um, you know, text me anytime, anytime you need anything. So sometimes it is like 9 p.m. and I say, oh, if I'm asleep, I'm not gonna answer until the morning, but I'll answer you at 7 a.m. You know, that, that's kind of thing. It's like, you know, they're very respectful and they don't abuse it, but you know, I, I, I want to be available and accessible and especially within, you know, just understanding like the emotional needs, especially of trainees who are working during this time. Um, you know, and just support everyone, but then, yep. I wanted to, I hope we haven't lost Nadine um, at the, oh, there, I think she's back. There we go. I wanted to offer something um, on the um, delegation piece. And uh, I was raised in a household, if you want something done right, you do it yourself, right? And then you get it perfect. That's kind of how, it, military man, Steve, daddy was 101st airborne in the army. Um, and so there's just, you know, if you want it done right, you do it yourself. Study to learn the best way and you do it. And then uh, someone taught me, and it was really a gift that I now offer to others, I actually teach a class on this, um, offered me the gift of recognizing that delegation is less about you than it is about the person to whom you're delegating. And if we're, if you're someone that believes in coaching and developing people, which I, I said I did, but I still would hold on to tasks, realize that, that delegation is a gift of development to the other person. Right. And of course, there are certain tasks that you delegate that in certain tasks that you don't. And there, are, there are ways that you should delegate and resources and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. But that turned something in my brain when I realized that that desire to hold on to it and do it right. Is it more important to do it right or is it more important to allow Carl Marie to grow in this area? Is it more important for it to be perfect or Joy's version of perfect? Or is it more important to give Carmela the opportunity to shine? And that clicked for me. And I, and I, I still struggle with it, Nadine, but that is now for, forefront of my mind. Thank you so much. Um, just to touch upon a question from the chat box um, for, the, for, the, for our panelists tonight from Maxine. In addition to our own individual resilience, how can we build resilience within our departments, units, or organizational culture? Yeah, so um, I can start with this one if that's okay. 
there's a it's a complicated question. You know, the the short answer, if we had 30 seconds, is make room for it as a leader. Okay. In the same way that the insults that affect us and they affect us in a different way, and the things that threaten our emotional, physical well-being, um, our solutions are equally, if not more, diverse than that. So you have to leave room for the individuals to pursue the things that are helpful helpful to them in these settings. Okay. Now I'll give you some examples of things that I've looked at, things that I've worked, and things I've heard about. LinkedIn shut down for a week. I think they did it two weeks ago. They shut down completely for a week. Okay. For the mere fact of like burnout prevention, if you Google it, you'll see the article that comes up. I believe Citibank right now, the uh, female CEO said, we're done with Zooms. No Zooms on, Zooms on Friday. And then she took it a step further and did no meeting Friday. A female commander in the Air Force, Janelle McCauley, pilot, PhD in human performance, had no emails from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, period, end of story. And everything seemed to be okay. And they seem to work out, right? So what if as an organization, you just looked at creating a culture and, and technology wise, you could in fact block emails. And if you go in Europe, they have these things called right to disconnect laws. Uh, they were uh, formed in 2017 in the European Union. And at, uh, I think it's 5.30 PM, you're done with email. And if a manager emails downstream after that time frame, there's a $250 fine and it grows from there. Okay, now I don't think that's gonna happen and it's not realistic in a lot of the jobs that we have, we need some accessibility. But if you build a culture that says, I'm gonna fill my outbox until Monday at 5 a.m. and then I'm gonna send them. Because I know when a supervisor of mine sends me an email and says, don't open till Monday, the first thing I do is I open it and then I just mark it on red. I mean, let's be realistic, right? So we have to look out for the people in our charge and we have to really not email them. And we have to tell them it's okay, or we have to tell them, and if they don't listen to us, that if I'm emailing you, because what we're doing is we're offloading our stress onto them. I need to get this done. I'm anxious about it. I'm gonna send it out and I'm gonna make it their problem until Monday, but I'm gonna tell them not to open their email. So I think the key thing is here, we have to make room for those things. We have to make room for a culture where we say, oh, every half hour Zoom block is an only 20 minute Zoom call because we've managed to make all of our productivity into equally measured 30 and one hour long intervals now. And none of them involve bathroom breaks or food breaks. None of us are eating. I bet we're all dehydrated. And I bet if we did a national kidney stone uh, research project right now, we would find it's up from profound dehydration. So these are the things I think we need to look for. So to Maxine, who's laughing and answered the question and asked the question, I think it's up for all of us to look at our space and find out where we can create room for the people that we care for to care for themselves. I would offer three quick things on that one. One is to model the behavior, which is really aligned with what Steve said. So you model resilience uh, and, and, and make sure that the people around you um, that look to you for that leadership see you bouncing back when things are difficult. Um, I also made a note to say um, that we ban Chicken Little. Everything is not the end of the world. The sky is not falling. Everything is not, you know, the end of the world. And so that that fatalistic piece, we ban the fatalistic piece. The third thing I wrote down was um, start to operate in a just culture type of way, right? And 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 it's okay um, that things aren't perfect. What's not okay is to hide when things aren't perfect. But hide when things aren't going well. I think that's an important part. And then the last thing is that we we ban whining where I work. We don't, there's no whining allowed here. We don't do that. We state something that may not be the way we'd like it to be. And then we immediately follow it up with ideas on how we can fix it. I don't allow people to um, uh, bring to me problems by themselves, no solo problems. You have to bring problem, problems must have a companion. And that is your idea of what we should do to fix it. Um, and let me fill in the gaps. If that's my role as that, because that's my role as the, the leader, let me fill in the gaps. Let me make sure you're resourced. Um, but those are, those are the things that are, is helping uh, build resilience um, where I am right now and in clients I've worked with in the past. I don't think anything I'm going to say is going to be much different from what you guys are saying, but um, I think in terms of, you know, making, making room for these improvements, um, it, it's also fostering that feeling of empowerment. And that sort of taps into like that helpless, hopeless feeling. The opposite of that is feeling empowered. And so 
um, I was just thinking when you were talking about, you know, no whining, we, we <laughs> I covered two different inpatient units and one of the units, they totally restructured the staff meetings um, to be weekly and not just like a set agenda and really not just whining because it turned into this like sort of, you know, hour long complaint session um, about whatever it was. And, and we sort of restructured it to almost more of like a problem solving, um, you know, session. So, and, and of course I get called in as the psychologist and like the mediator, uh, this person's upset about this discipline because this discipline did that or whatever it was, um, just sort of like, okay, let's turn it around and we all hear each other. So what can we do about this? And what's the next step? And I think that really, you know, that problem solving, point of view, that perspective really helps with feeling empowered, right? Because, okay, well, we all came together and we created this protocol or whatever it was. Um, so again, not, nothing new from what you guys are saying, but it just made me think about that specific example and how I do try to instill feelings of empowerment in you know, my, my, uh, my colleagues and students and patients. Great, thank you, Nadine and everyone. Um, as we close, we're gonna about to close our events. Um, I just wanted to give a special thank you to everyone who participated and a special thank you to our wonderful panelists, Joy, Nadine and Steve. Uh, we, if we could give a virtual round of applause, that would be great. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this topic. It was very informative. Um, thanks again for everybody. Thanks to the Hostra and Alumni Office for supporting, continue supporting the MHA program. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and anyone can enjoy the rest of the National Public Health Week.